Well, the cat's out of the bag. Because you should figure out where we are going to be this morning, and that is Psalm uh, 61. If you've got your Bible with you, uh, head on over to Psalm 61. If you don't, the words will appear on the screen behind me. Psalm 61, let us pray. God, we thank you that we could uh, come to your house of worship today. And God, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to fall afresh upon us this morning God, by your presence, by your strength, may you revive us for the journey. And God, I pray that your word would speak a fresh word into our heart, mind, and soul this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 61, beginning with verse 1. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then will I ever sing praise to your name and fulfill my vows day after day. I recently came across this testimony and I want to share it with you this morning. I typically start my day in emails, and by 7.30, I am consumed with the world. At the end of the day, I would check in with God and give him what I, have left, oh, what I had left over, which wasn't much. Sad looking back on it, but what a difference now. I start my day by giving my life to God when my battery is charged. My prayer life has gone from checking in with God to him changing my life and leading me. On February 27th, I tested positive for COVID. I only had mild symptoms like losing my sense of taste and smell. Then on Saturday, I woke up with hives covering my body and my lips swelling. After a trip to urgent care and getting a steroid shot, I assumed things would get better. Not so fast. I had the same issue the next four mornings. Two of those mornings, I ended up in the ER for more treatment, and the other two mornings, I was able to fight off the hives with medication. I was getting concerned with how much longer this was going to last. After a day of hives and trying to work, I found myself alone in my house, which is unusual. I had been battling COVID and hives, and not once had I prayed. I immediately lifted up my situation to God, and the next morning I woke up hive free. What a relief. What a lesson for me. How awesome is our God, because he delights in answering our prayers. Psalm 61 is a prayer of David. And right from the very beginning of this prayer, you can tell that it is the prayer of a man who is desperate and panicked. Verse 1 says, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. Those are the words of a man who is desperate and panicked. You see, David understood these panicked and and desperate feelings a whole lot better than we do. Because time and time again, in David's life, he always found himself in these threatening situations. And without the help and protection of God, David was as good as dead. Think about David when he was a 15-year-old little shepherd boy taking his slingshot and going out after that man of war, Goliath. David was a soldier in Israel's army. Every time he went onto that battlefield, engaged in hand-to-hand combat, David was putting his life in harm's way. 
And then most certainly there was his ordeal with King Saul. As King Saul chased him through the wilderness for seven years trying to kill and take David's life. In Psalm chapter 61, or Psalm 61, most commentators believe that David prayed this prayer when he was fleeing from his son, Absalom, who had proclaimed himself as the new king over Israel. And so Absalom gathers this massive and and huge army, and he marches towards the city of Jerusalem. So in desperation and fear and panic, David gathers together a little small army, a little entourage of people, and David flees for his life by escaping the city. Psalm 61 is teaching us that God is a God of the desperate. That God is a God of the panicked. That God is a God of the overwhelmed, the trapped, the helpless, the hopeless, the oppressed, the defenseless. My friends, when there is no other way of rescue, when you have exhausted all other avenues, I declare to you this morning, there is still God. The Lord should not be our last resort. God should be our first. He hears your cries. He knows your needs. And God will answer. It might not happen as fast as you would like. It might not happen how you would like. But God will be your answer. In Psalm 61, David uses five metaphors to speak of the protection and presence and help that he needs from God. I want to read verses 2 through 4 again, and I'm going to point out to you the five metaphors that David uses, beginning in verse 2. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Here's number one. Lead me to the rock. That is higher than I. For you have been my number two refuge. Number three, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your number four tent forever. And take refuge in the shelter of your number five wings. The first metaphor that David uses to describe God is that he is his rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. What David is praying, what David is saying, is that God is for sure. God is his strength. God is his foundation. And that is where David is going to anchor his heart and his soul and his life to. Number two, David says that God has been his refuge or his shelter. In the Hebrew, that word refuge or shelter literally means shade. It speaks of taking protection against the elements of nature. And so what David is saying is that he is going to place himself under the shelter of God the way a person would shelter themselves from the sun, the rain, the heat, the wind, the cold. David is longing for the protection of God. Number three, David says that God is his strong tower. In David's day, cities would erect very high towers, and it was the most fortified place in a city. When an enemy attacked a city, the people would go up into this tower as the place of greatest protection. David says, number four, in verse four, I long to dwell in your tent forever. When David speaks of the tent, he is speaking of the tabernacle of God. You see, the tent or or the tabernacle of God was the place where God lived. If you wanted to experience the presence of God, you would find it in the tent of meeting or in the tabernacle of God. 
My friends, David is praying and asking to feel and experience the presence and intimacy of God. When we look upon our own lives, when do we feel most distant and empty of the presence of God? It is when we are in the valley of trouble. David is praying and asking that he will experience and feel the presence and intimacy and closeness of God in this ordeal. Finally, number five, David says that he wants to take shelter under the wings of God. David is, is using a metaphor of, of a mother bird who, who is gathering her chicks under her wings and she is protecting them from harm. My friends, Psalm 61 is the prayer of a man whose strength is growing weak. It's the prayer of a man whose heart is growing faint and discouraged. His heart is empty. His heart is desperate. And without the presence and protection of God, David realizes that he is dead. But rather than deny the ordeal, the sadness, the threat, the worry, the anxiety, David took it to the Lord in prayer. David lays it on the table for God to deal with it. David takes his hands off of the threat and he gives it to God asking for his help, asking for his power, asking for his peace, asking for his protection, asking for his insight in dealing with it. And guess what? God came through. God protected and saved David's life. If you have got something going on in your life, you have got to put it to prayer. How do you deal with people that you don't like? How do you press forward despite the inevitable setbacks that are going to come into each and every one of our lives? How do you heal after your heart is broken? How do you remain hopeful and positive when you are living through negative and difficult circumstances? My friends, none of those things have easy answers. But at the very minimum, we have got to put it to the Lord in prayer. Are you complaining about people who get under your skin? Or are you praying for the people who get under your skin? Are you praying for God's grace, God's peace, God's goodness to bless their lives? Is it easy? No. If it were, I would not have to stand here this morning and preach that. When worry and anxiety comes knocking at your door, your first reaction should be to run to the one who is your rock, your shelter, your tower, your tabernacle, your wings. But pastor, I do that. And the worry and the anxiety creeps back into my heart, then keep running back over and over and over again to the one who is your rock, your shelter, your tower, your tabernacles, your wings. Until you come to that place in your life where the security and peace and presence of Jesus is guarding your heart and your mind. When we get so focused on the situation, we lose sight of God. But when we come to the Lord in prayer, 
we will begin to see our circumstance from the perspective of the one who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-caring, all-loving, all-good, always faithful. Charles Spurgeon was known as the Prince of Peach Preachers. On October 19th, 1856, he was preaching to 10,000 people in London Surrey Gardens Music Hall when someone yelled, fire, and pure pandemonium broke out in the music hall. Those trying to, to get into the building uh, blocked those who were trying to flee from the building. And in the midst of the pandemonium, a balcony collapsed, killed seven people, and seriously injured 28. Charles Spurgeon's text that night was Proverbs 3.33. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. A text he would never preach again. In fact, after that night, Charles Spurgeon came close to never preaching again, period. For quite some time, the very sight of a Bible would cause him to weep. Charles Spurgeon was 22 years old when that incident happened. He had just been installed as the pastor as Metropolitan Tabernacle that would later become the largest church in the world. He had just married 10 months earlier and had twin boys at home who were just days old. And not to mention, the London newspapers were blaming him for the tragedy. And Charles Spurgeon found himself crushed under the weight of the emotional and mental stress of it all. Yet Charles Spurgeon went on to advance the kingdom of God like few others have. He wrote 150 books, started a college, and led 66 charities. But despite his many achievements... His life was marked by constant depression and melancholy. So how did Charles Spurgeon learn to manage the pain and the depressive emotions he felt? This is his explanation. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. It's a powerful sentence. Do you know what Spurgeon is saying? And now is saying to us this morning, when you have got something going on in your life, you can't ignore it. You cannot hide it. You cannot deny it. You must face it. If you are here this morning and you are living in a season of misery, a day of uncertainty, a day of difficulty, then come to the throne of God boldly in prayer. When the diagnosis of cancer comes, when we lose a loved one we love to death, when we experience disappointment and failure, no matter what we are facing in life, we must learn to kiss the wave that throws us against the rock of ages. Now here's what I want you to notice about Psalm 61. David begins it in verse 1 in desperation. But in verse 8, David ends it in praise. Then will I ever sing praise to your name and fulfill my vows day after day. Even when David's heart is broken, even when the outcome of this situation is still uncertain, David found peace and joy and strength in God. And all it did was lead him to the praise of God. 
of God. My friends, prayer allows us to grow richer in the things of God. We grow richer through prayer as we experience his grace, his presence, his power, his goodness, his strength, his love. And it should lead us to praise him for the great and wonderful and awesome Lord that he is. My friends, if David could praise Jesus, then what about us? Because we are living on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. We are living on this side of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For David, there was no cross. There was no resurrection. Yet David wraps up the prayer by vowing to praise his God for the great and wonderful and amazing Savior he was. My friends, because of the cross of Jesus, because of the empty tomb of Jesus, we live in praise because we live in life and hope and victory. Judith Roberts was a single mom who was struggling with life and, and motherhood. And when she finally hit the brick wall, the bills were piling up. Her children were not doing well in school. And anxiety and fear and worry were, were overwhelming her heart. But Judith experienced a breakthrough. Her daughter Lisa had lost out in the final round of her second grade spelling bee by misspelling the word afraid. So Judith drew on the wisdom of her mother and grandmother and she pulled her children together and she said to them, what we have here is a red letter failure day. Let's go celebrate. As her children stared at her in confusion, this is what she said to them. My grandma Taos used to say, we learn more from our failures than from our successes. The more a stone is weathered by troubles, the farther it will skip. Let's go to McDonald's for our first failure party. Looking back many years later, Judith Roberts wrote, that led to many great failure parties. And we learned to look for what we could celebrate from our tragedies rather than agonize over what we had suffered. Maybe for us today, as we bear perhaps the weightiness and the heaviness of life in our soul, is to have our own little failure party right here at church. Because 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on that cross, his life and ministry looked like an absolute failure. But thank God, three days later, Jesus walked out of that grave alive. My friends, Jesus' greatest failure became our greatest point of celebration. In him, our sins are forgiven. In him, there is life, abundant life. In his name, there is eternal life for anyone who believes in the Son of God who died on the cross, who was resurrected back to new life and now sits at the throne of God Almighty, sovereign over all things. In Jesus, there is life. In Jesus, there is hope. In Jesus, there is victory. And because of that, and in spite of whatever it is we are going through, we too can pray with David and say, then will I ever sing praise to your name. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your grace. 
And God, we thank you that we could come to the table as we eat this bread and as we drink this cup. Lord Jesus, we celebrate what it is that you did for us. Father, in the quiet, in the stillness of this prayer, perhaps there's someone here this morning who is fading, facing the, the weightiness, the, the heaviness of life. Father, in this time of silence, I pray that they would bring it to your throne of grace. Perhaps for, for some of us here today, we come with joy. We come with praise. We come with celebration. Let us also bring that to the throne of your grace this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.